Section 24 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3, translated by Jonathan Scott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Adventure of the Caliph Harun al-Rashid The Caliph Harun al-Rashid was one day suffering from depression of spirits, when his faithful and favourite Grand Vizier, Jaafir, came to him. This minister, finding him alone, which was seldom the case, and perceiving, as he approached, that he was in a very melancholy humour, and never lifted up his eyes, stopped till he should vouchsafe to look at him. At last the caliph turned his eyes towards him, but presently withdrew them again, and remained in the same posture, motionless as before. The Grand Vizier, observing nothing in the caliph's eyes which regarded him personally, took the liberty to speak to him, and said, Commander of the Faithful, will your majesty give me leave to ask whence proceeds this melancholy, of which you always seemed to me so little susceptible? Indeed, vizier, answered the caliph, brightening up his countenance, I am very little subject to it, and had not perceived it but for you. But I will remain no longer in this hippish mood. If no new affair brought you hither, you will gratify me by inventing something to dispel it. Commander of the faithful, replied the Grand Vizier, my duty obliged me to wait on you, and I take the liberty to remind your majesty that this is the day which you have appointed to inform yourself of the good government of your capital and its environs, and this occasion very opportunely presents itself to dispel those clouds which obscure your natural gaiety. "'You do well to remind me,' replied the caliph, "'for I had entirely forgotten it. "'Go and change your dress, while I do the same.' They each put on the habit of a foreign merchant, and under that disguise went out by a private door of the palace garden, which led into the country. After they had gone round part of the city to the banks of the Euphrates, at some distance from the walls, without having observed anything disorderly, they crossed the river in the first boat they met, and making a tour on the other side, crossed the bridge, which formed the communication betwixt the two parts of the town. At the foot of this bridge they met an old blind man, who asked alms of them. The caliph turned about, and put a piece of gold into his hand. The blind man instantly caught hold of his hand and stopped him. "'Charitable person,' said he, "'whoever you are, whom God hath inspired to bestow alms on me, do not refuse the favour I ask of you to give me a box on the ear, for I deserve that and a greater punishment.' Having thus spoken, he let the caliph's hand go, that he might strike. But for fear he should pass on without doing it, held him fast by his clothes. The caliph, surprised both at the words and action of the blind man, said, I cannot comply with your request. I will not lessen the merit of my charity by treating you as you would have me. After these words he endeavoured to get away from the blind man. The blind man, who expected this reluctance of his benefactor, exerted himself to detain him, Sir, said he, forgive my boldness and importunity. I desire you would either give me a box on the ear, or take your arms back again, for I cannot receive it but on that condition, without breaking a solemn oath which I have sworn to God. And if you knew the reason, you would agree with me that the punishment is very slight. The caliph, unwilling to be detained any longer, yielded to the importunity of the blind man, and gave him a very slight blow, whereupon he immediately let him go, thanked and blessed him. When the caliph and vizier had got some small distance from the blind man, the caliph said to Jaafir, This blind man must certainly have some very uncommon reasons which make him behave himself in this manner to all who give him alms. I should be glad to know them. Therefore return, Tell him who I am, and bid him not fail to come to my palace about prayer time in the afternoon of tomorrow, that I may have some conversation with him. 
the grand vizier returned bestowed his alms on the blind man and after he had given him a box on the ear told him the caliph's order and then returned to the caliph when they came into the town they found in the square a great crowd of spectators looking at a handsome well-shaped young man who was mounted on a mare which he drove and urged full speed round the place spurring and whipping the poor creature so barbarously that she was all over sweat and blood the caliph amazed at the inhumanity of the rider stopped to ask the people if they knew why he used the mare so ill but could learn nothing except that for some time past he had every day at the same hour treated her in the same manner as they went along the caliph bade the grand vizier take particular notice of the place and not fail to order the young man to attend the next day at the hour appointed to the blind man but before the caliph got to his palace he observed in a street which he had not passed through a long time before an edifice newly built which seemed to him to be the palace of some one of the great lords of the court he asked the grand vizier if he knew to whom it belonged who answered he did not but would inquire and thereupon asked a neighbour who told him that the house was that of one Khawja hassan surnamed al hubal on account of his original trade of rope making which he had seen him work at himself when poor that without knowing how fortune had favoured him he supposed he must have acquired great wealth as he defrayed honourably and splendidly the expenses he had been at in building the grand vizier rejoined the caliph and gave him a full account of what he had heard i must see this fortunate rope-maker said the caliph therefore go and tell him to come to my palace at the same hour you have ordered the other two accordingly the vizier obeyed the next day after afternoon prayers the caliph retired to his own apartment when the grand vizier introduced the three persons we have been speaking of and presented them to the caliph they all three prostrated themselves before the throne and when they rose up the caliph asked the blind man his name who answered it was baba abdullah baba abdullah replied the caliph your manner of asking alms seemed so strange to me yesterday that if it had not been for some private considerations i should not have complied with your request but should have prevented you from giving any more offence to the public i ordered you to come hither to know from yourself what could have induced you to make the indiscreet oath you told me of that i may judge whether you have done well and if i ought to suffer you to continue a practice that appears to me to set so ill an example tell me freely how so extravagant a thought came into your head and do not disguise anything from me for i will absolutely know the truth baba abdullah intimidated by this reprimand cast himself a second time at the foot of the caliph's throne with his face to the ground and when he rose up said commander of the faithful i most humbly ask your majesty's pardon for my presumption in daring to have required and almost forced you to do a thing which indeed appears so contrary to reason i acknowledge my offence but as i did not then know your majesty i implore your clemency and hope you will consider my ignorance as to the extravagance of my action i own it and own also that it must seem strange to mankind but in the eye of god it is a slight penance i have enjoined myself for an enormous crime of which i have been guilty and for which if all the people in the world were each to give me a box on the ear it would not be a sufficient atonement your majesty will judge of this yourself when in telling my story in obedience to your commands i shall inform you what that heinous crime was End of section 24section 25 of the arabian nights entertainments volume 3 translated by jonathan scott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry
The Adventure of the Caliph Harun al Rashid, Part Two. The Story of Baba Abdullah. Commander of the Faithful, I was born at Baghdad, had a moderate fortune left me by my father and mother, who died within a few days of each other. Though I was then but young, I did not squander away my fortune as most young men do, in idle expenses and debauchery. On the contrary, I neglected no opportunity to increase it by my industry. At last, I became rich enough to purchase fourscore camels, which I let out to merchants for caravans, who paid me well for every journey I went with them throughout the extent of your majesty's dominions. In the midst of this prosperity, and with an ardent desire of growing much richer, as I was returning one day with my camels unloaded from Bussorah, whither I had carried some bales that were to be embarked for the Indies, I met with good pasturage at some distance from any habitation, made a halt, and let my beasts graze for some time. While I was seated, a dervish, who was walking to Bussorah, came and sat down by me to rest himself. I asked him whence he came, and where he was going. He put the same questions to me, and when we had satisfied each other's curiosity, we produced our provisions and ate together. During our repast, after we had talked on many indifferent subjects, the dervish told me that he knew of a spot, a small distance from thence, where there were such immense riches, that if all my fourscore camels were loaded with the gold and jewels that might be taken from it, they would not be missed. This intelligence surprised and charmed me, and I was so overjoyed that I could scarcely contain myself. I could not believe that the dervish was capable of telling me a falsehood. Therefore I fell upon his neck, and said, Good dervish, I know you value not the riches of this world. Therefore, of what service can the knowledge of this treasure be to you? You are alone, and cannot carry much of it away. Show me where it is. I will load all my camels and, as an acknowledgment of the favour done me, will present you with one of them. Indeed, I offered very little, but after he had communicated the secret to me, my desire of riches was become so violent that I thought it a great deal, and looked upon the seventy-nine camel loads which I reserved for myself as nothing in comparison of what I allowed him. The dervish, though he saw my avarice, was not, however, angry at the unreasonable return I proposed to make him, but replied without the least concern, You are sensible, brother, that what you offer me is not proportionable to the valuable favour you ask of me. I might have chosen whether I would communicate my secret to you or not, and have kept the treasure to myself, but what I have told you is sufficient to show my good intentions. It is in my power to oblige you, and make both our fortunes. I have, however, another proposition more just and equitable to make to you. It lies in your own breast, whether or no you will agree to it. You say, continued the dervish, that you have fourscore camels. I am ready to conduct you to the place where the treasure lies, and we will load them with as much jewels and gold as they can carry, on condition that when they are so loaded, you will let me have one half, and you be contented with the other, after which we will separate, and take our camels where we may think fit. You see, there is nothing but what is strictly equitable in this division, for if you give me forty camels, you will procure by my means wherewithal to purchase thousands. I could not but agree there was a great deal of justice in what the dervish said but without considering what riches I should gain in accepting of the condition he proposed, I could not without reluctance think of parting with my forty camels, especially when I reflected that the dervish would then be as rich as myself. Avarice made me unmindful that I was beforehand making an ungrateful return for a favour purely gratuitous. But there was no time to hesitate. I must either accept of the proposal or resolve to repent all my lifetime of losing by my own fault an opportunity of obtaining an immense fortune. That instant I collected all my camels, 
and after we had travelled some time we came into a valley the pass into which was so narrow that two camels could not go abreast the two mountains which bounded this valley formed nearly a circle but were so high craggy and steep that there was no fear of our being seen by anybody when we came between these two mountains the dervish said to me stop your camels make them kneel that we may load them the easier and i will proceed to discover the treasure i did as the dervish directed and going to him soon after found him with a match in one hand gathering sticks to light a fire which he had no sooner done than he cast some incense into it and pronouncing certain words which i did not understand there presently arose a thick cloud he divided this cloud when the rock though of a prodigious perpendicular height opened like two folding doors and exposed to view a magnificent palace in the hollow of the mountain which i supposed to be rather the workmanship of genii than of men for man could hardly have attempted such a bold and surprising work but this i must tell your majesty was an afterthought which did not occur to me at the moment so eager was i for the treasures which displayed themselves to my view that i did not even stop to admire the magnificent columns and arcades which i saw on all sides and without attention to the regularity with which the treasures were ranged like an eagle seizing her prey i fell upon the first heap of golden coin that was near me my sacks were all large and with my good will i would have filled them all but i was obliged to proportion my burden to the strength of my camels the dervish did the same but i perceived he paid more attention to the jewels and when he told me the reason i followed his example so that we took away much more jewels than gold when we had filled our sacks and loaded our camels we had nothing left to do but to shut up the treasure and go our way but before we parted the dervish went again into the treasury where there were a great many wrought vessels of gold of different forms i observed that he took out of one of these vessels a little box of a certain wood which i knew not and put it into his breast but first showed me that it contained only a kind of glutinous ointment the dervish used the same incantations to shut the treasury as he had done to open it and after he pronounced certain words the doors closed and the rock seemed as solid and entire as before we now divided our camels i put myself at the head of the forty which i had reserved for myself and the dervish placed himself at the head of the rest which i had given him we came out of the valley by the way we had entered and travelled together till we came to the great road where we were to part the dervish to go to bussara and i to baghdad to thank him for so great a kindness i made use of the most expressive terms testifying my gratitude for the preference he had given me before all other men in letting me have a share of such riches we embraced each other with great joy and taking our leave pursued our different routes i had not gone far following my camels which paced quietly on in the track i had put them into before the demon of ingratitude and envy took possession of my heart and i deplored the loss of my other forty but much more the riches wherewith they were loaded the dervish said i to myself has no occasion for all this wealth since he is master of the treasure and may have as much as he pleases so i gave myself up to the blackest ingratitude and determined immediately to take the camels with their loading from him to execute this design i first stopped my own camels then ran after the dervish and called to him as loud as i could giving him to understand that i had something material to say to him and made a sign to him to stop which he accordingly did when i came up to him i said brother i had no sooner parted from you but a thought came into my head which neither of us had reflected on before you are a recluse dervish used to live in tranquillity disengaged from all the cares of the world and intent only upon serving god you know not perhaps what trouble you have taken upon yourself 
to take care of so many camels. If you would take my advice, you would keep but thirty. You will find them sufficiently troublesome to manage. Take my word, I have had experience. I believe you are right, replied the dervish, who found he was not able to contend with me. I own I never thought of this. I begin already to be uneasy at what you have stated. Choose which ten you please, and take them, and go on in God's keeping. I set ten apart, and after I had driven them off, I put them in the road to follow my others. I could not have imagined that the dervish would be so easily persuaded to part with his camels, which increased my covetousness, and made me flatter myself that it would be no hard matter to get ten more. Wherefore, instead of thanking him for his present, I said to him again, Brother, the interest I take in your repose is so great that I cannot resolve to part from you without desiring you to consider once more how difficult a thing it is to govern thirty loaded camels, especially for you who are not used to such work. You will find it much better to return me as many more back as you have done already. What I tell you is not for my own sake and interest, but to do you the greater kindness. Ease yourself then of the camels, and leave them to me, who can manage a hundred as well as one. My discourse had the desired effect upon the dervish, who gave me without any hesitation the other ten camels, so that he had but twenty left, and I was master of sixty, and might boast of greater riches than any sovereign princes. Any one would have thought I should now have been content, but, as a person afflicted with a dropsy, the more he drinks, the more thirsty he is, so I became more greedy, and desirous of the other twenty camels. I redoubled my solicitations and importunities to make the dervish condescend to grant me ten of the twenty, which he did with a good grace, and as to the other ten he had left, I embraced him, kissed his feet, and caressed him, conjuring him not to refuse me, but to complete the obligation I should ever have to him, so that at length he crowned my joy by giving me them also. Make a good use of them, brother, said the dervish, and remember that God can take away riches as well as give them, if we do not assist the poor, whom he suffers to be in want, on purpose that the rich may merit by their charity a recompense in the other world. My infatuation was so great that I could not profit by such wholesome advice. I was not content, though I had my forty camels again, and knew they were loaded with an inestimable treasure. But a thought came into my head that the little box of ointment which the dervis showed me had something in it more precious than all the riches which I was obliged to him for. The place from whence the dervish took it, said I to myself, and his care to secure it, makes me believe there is something mysterious in it. This determined me to obtain it. I had just embraced him and bade him adieu, but as I turned about from him, I said, What will you do with that little box of ointment? It seems such a trifle, it is not worth your carrying away. I entreat you to make me a present of it. For what occasion has a dervish as you are, who has renounced the vanities of the world, for perfumes or scented ointments? Would to heaven he had refused me that box! But if he had, I was stronger than he, and resolved to have taken it from him by force, that for my complete satisfaction it might not be said he had carried away the smallest part of the treasure. The dervish, far from denying me, readily pulled it out of his bosom, and presenting it to me with the best grace in the world, said, Here, take it, brother, and be content. If I could do more for you, you needed but to have asked me. I should have been ready to satisfy you. When I had the box in my hand, I opened it, and looking at the ointment, said to him, Since you are so good, I am sure you will not refuse me the favour to tell me the particular use of this ointment. The use is very surprising and wonderful, 
replied the dervish. If you apply a little of it round the left eye and upon the lid, you will see at once all the treasures contained in the bosom of the earth. But if you apply it to the right eye, it will make you blind. I would make the experiment myself. Take the box, said I to the dervish, and apply some to my left eye. You understand how to do it better than I, and I long to experience what seems so incredible. Accordingly, I shut my left eye, and the dervish took the trouble to apply the unguent. I opened my eye, and was convinced he had told me the truth. I saw immense treasures, and such prodigious riches, so diversified, that it is impossible for me to give an account of them. But as I was obliged to keep my right eye shut with my hand, and that tired me, I desired the dervish to apply some of the pomatum to that eye. I am ready to do it, said the dervish, but you must remember what I told you, that if you put any of it upon your right eye, you would immediately be blind. Such is the virtue of the ointment. Far from being persuaded of the truth of what the dervish said, I imagined, on the contrary, that there was some new mystery which he meant to hide from me. Brother, replied I, smiling, I see plainly you wish to mislead me. It is not natural that this ointment should have two such contrary effects. The matter is as I tell you, replied the dervish, taking the name of God to bear witness. You ought to believe me, for I cannot disguise the truth. I would not believe the dervish, who spoke like an honest man. My insurmountable desire of seeing at my will all the treasures in the world, and perhaps of enjoying those treasures to the extent I coveted, had such an effect upon me that I could not hearken to his remonstrances, nor be persuaded of what was, however, but too true, as to my lasting misfortune I soon experienced. I persuaded myself that if the ointment, by being applied to the left eye, had the virtue of showing me all the treasures of the earth, by being applied to the right, it might have the power of putting them in my disposal. Possessed with this thought, I obstinately pressed the dervish to apply the ointment to my right eye, but he as positively refused. Brother, said he, after I have done you so much service, I cannot resolve to do you so great an injury. Consider with yourself what a misfortune it is to be deprived of one's eyesight. Do not reduce me to the hard necessity of obliging you in a thing which you will repent of all your life. I persisted in my obstinacy, and said to him in strong terms, Brother, I earnestly desire you to lay aside all your difficulties. You have granted me most generously all that I have asked of you hitherto. And would you have me go away dissatisfied with you, at last, about a thing of so little consequence? For God's sake, grant me this last favour. Whatever happens, I will not lay the blame on you, but take it upon myself alone. The dervish made all the resistance possible, but seeing that I was able to force him to do it, he said, Since you will absolutely have it so, I will satisfy you and thereupon he took a little of the fatal ointment and applied it to my right eye, which I kept shut. But alas, when I came to open it, I could distinguish nothing with either eye but thick darkness, and became blind as you see me now. Ah, dervish! I exclaimed in agony. What you forewarned me of has proved but too true. Fatal curiosity, added I, insatiable desire of riches into what an abyss of miseries have they cast me i am now sensible what a misfortune i have brought upon myself but you dear brother cried i addressing myself to the dervish who are so charitable and good among the many wonderful secrets you are acquainted with have you not one to restore to me my sight again miserable wretch answered the dervish if you would have been advised by me, you would have avoided this misfortune. But you have your deserts. The blindness of your mind was the cause of the loss of your eyes. 
It is true I have secrets, some of which, during the short time we have been together, you have by my liberality witnessed, but I have none to restore to you your sight. Pray to God, therefore, if you believe there is one. It is he alone that can restore it to you. He gave you riches of which you were unworthy. On that account, takes them from you again, and will by my hands give them to men not so ungrateful as yourself. The dervish said no more, and I had nothing to reply. He left me to myself overwhelmed with confusion, and plunged in inexpressible grief. After he had collected my camels, he drove them away, and pursued the road to Bussara. I cried out loudly as he was departing, and entreated him not to leave me in that miserable condition, but to conduct me at least to the first caravanserai. But he was deaf to my prayers and entreaties. Thus deprived of sight and all I had in the world, I should have died with affliction and hunger, if the next day a caravan returning from Bussara had not received me charitably and brought me back to Baghdad. After this manner was I reduced without remedy from a condition worthy the envy of princes for riches and magnificence, though not for power, to beggary without resource. I had no other way to subsist but by asking charity, which I have done till now. But to expiate my offence against God, I enjoined myself, by way of penance, a box on the ear from every charitable person who should commiserate my condition. This, commander of the faithful, is the motive which seemed so strange to your majesty yesterday, and for which I ought to incur your indignation. I ask your pardon once more as your slave, and submit to receive the chastisement I deserve. And if you vouchsafe to pronounce anything beyond the penance I have imposed upon myself, I am ready to undergo it, since I am persuaded you must think it too slight and much too little for my crime. The blind man having concluded his story, the caliph said, Baba Abdullah, your sin has been great, but God be praised, you feel the enormity of your guilt, and your penance proves your repentance. You must continue it, not ceasing to ask of God pardon in every prayer your religion obliges you to say daily but that you may not be prevented from your devotions by the care of getting your living, I will settle a charity on you during your life of four silver dirhams a day, which my grand vizier shall give you daily with the penance. Therefore do not go away, but wait till he has executed my orders. At these words, Baba Abdullah prostrated himself before the caliph's throne, returned him thanks, and wished him all happiness and prosperity. The caliph, very well satisfied with the story of Baba Abdullah and the dervish, addressed himself to the young man who used his mare so ill, and asked him his name, to which he replied it was Syed Nalmaun. Syed Nalmaun, resumed the caliph, I have seen horses exercised all my life, and have often exercised them myself but never in so barbarous a manner as you yesterday treated your mare in the full square, to the great offence of all the spectators who murmured loudly at your conduct. I myself was not less displeased, and had nearly, contrary to my intention, discovered who I was, to have punished your cruelty. By your air and behaviour you do not seem to be a barbarous or a cruel man, and therefore I would fain believe that you had reason for what you did, since I am informed that this was not the first time, but that you practice the same treatment every day. I would know what is the cause, and sent for you for that purpose, that you should tell me the truth, and disguise nothing from me. Said Naumaun understood what the caliph demanded of him. The relation was painful to him. He changed colour several times and could not help showing how greatly he was embarrassed. However, he must resolve to tell his story. But before he spoke, he prostrated himself before the caliph's throne, and after he rose up, endeavoured to speak to satisfy the caliph, but was so confounded, not so much at the presence of the caliph as by the nature of his relation, that he was speechless. 
the caliph notwithstanding his natural impatience to be obeyed showed not the least anger at said naumaun's silence he saw plainly that he either had not assurance to speak before him or was intimidated by the tone of his voice or in short that there was something to be concealed in his story said naumaun said the caliph to encourage him recollect yourself but tell your story as if you were speaking not to me but to your most familiar friend if there is anything in your relation which troubles you and you think i may be offended at it i pardon you beforehand therefore be not uneasy but speak boldly and freely and disguise nothing said naumaun encouraged by these words said commander of the faithful whatever apprehensions a man may be under at your majesty's presence i am sensible those respectful sensations would not deprive me of the use of my speech so as to fail in my obedience in giving you satisfaction in any other matter but this you now ask of me i dare not say i am the most perfect of men yet i am not wicked enough to have committed or to have had an intention of committing anything against the laws to fear their severity and yet i cannot say i am exempt from sin through ignorance in this case i do not say that i depend upon your majesty's pardon but will submit myself to your justice and receive the punishment i deserve i own that the manner in which i have for some time treated my mare and which your majesty has witnessed is strange and sets an ill example but i hope you will think the motive well grounded and that i am more worthy of compassion than chastisement but not to keep your majesty any longer in suspense by a long preamble i will tell you my story end of section twenty five section twenty six of the arabian nights entertainments volume three translated by jonathan scott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry the adventure of the caliph harun al rashid part three the story of syed Nalmaun. i shall not trouble your majesty with my birth which is not illustrious enough to merit your attention for my situation my parents by their good economy left me enough to live on like an honest man, free from ambition, or being burdensome to any one. With these advantages, the only blessing I wanted to render my happiness complete was an amiable wife, who might share them with me. But that was a blessing it did not please God to grant me. On the contrary, it was my misfortune to have one who, the very next day after our wedding, began to exercise my patience in a manner not to be conceived by any one who has not had the same trial. As it is the custom for us to marry without seeing or knowing whom we are to espouse, your majesty is sensible that a husband has no reason to complain when he finds that the wife who has been chosen for him is not horribly ugly and deformed, and that her carriage, wit, and behaviour make amends for any slight bodily imperfections. The first time I saw my wife, with her face uncovered, after she was brought home with the usual ceremonies to my house, I rejoiced to find that I had not been imposed upon in the description of her person, which pleased me, and she was perfectly agreeable to my inclination. The next day after our wedding, when our dinner was served up, which consisted of several dishes, I went into the room where the cloth was laid, and, not finding my wife there, ordered her to be called. After making me wait a long time, she came. I dissembled my impatience. We sat down, and I began with the rice, which I took up as usual. On the other hand, my wife, instead of using her hand as everybody does, pulled a little case out of her pocket, and took out of it a kind of bodkin, with which she picked up the rice, and put it into her mouth, grain by grain. Surprised at this manner of eating, I said to her, Amina, which was her name, are you used to eat rice so in your family? Or do you do it because you are a little eater? 
or would you count the grains that you may not eat more at one time than another if you do it out of frugality or to teach me not to be extravagant you have no reason to fear as i can assure you we shall not ruin ourselves that way we have god be thanked enough to live at our ease without depriving ourselves of necessaries do not restrain yourself my dear amina but eat as you see me eat the kind manner in which i made these remonstrances might have produced some obliging answer but she without saying a word continued to eat as she had begun at last to make me the more uneasy she ate a grain of rice at intervals only and instead of eating any of the other meats with me she only now and then put some crumbs of bread into her mouth but not so much as a sparrow would have pecked i was much provoked at her obstinacy but yet to indulge and excuse her i imagined that she had not been used to eat with men before whom she might perhaps have been taught to restrain herself but at the same time thought she carried it too far out of pure simplicity i fancied again that she might have breakfasted late or that she might have a wish to eat alone and more at liberty these considerations prevented me from saying more to her then to ruffle her temper by showing any sign of dissatisfaction after dinner i left her but not with an air that showed any displeasure at supper and the next day and every time we ate together she behaved herself in the same manner i knew it was impossible for a woman to live on so little food as she took and that there must be some mystery in her conduct which i did not understand this made me resolve to dissemble i appeared to take no notice of her actions in hopes that time would bring her to live with me as i desired she should but my hopes were in vain and it was not long before i was convinced they were so one night when amina thought me fast asleep she got out of bed softly dressed herself with great precaution not to make a noise for fear of waking me i could not comprehend her design but curiosity made me feign a sound sleep as soon as she had dressed herself she went softly out of the room when she was gone i arose threw my cloak over my shoulders and had time enough to see from a window that looked into my courtyard that she opened the street door and went out i immediately ran down to the door which she had left half open and followed her by moonlight till i saw her enter a burying ground just by our house i got to the end of the wall taking care not to be seen and looking over saw amina with a ghoul your majesty knows that the ghouls of both sexes are wandering demons which generally infest old buildings from whence they rush out by surprise on people that pass by kill them and eat their flesh and for want of such prey will sometimes go in the night into burying grounds and feed on dead bodies which they dig up i was struck with astonishment and horror to see my wife with this ghoul they dug up a dead body which had been buried but that day and the ghoul cut off pieces of the flesh which they ate together by the graveside conversing during their shocking and inhuman repast but i was too far off to hear their discourse which must have been as strange as their meal the remembrance of which still makes me shudder when they had finished this horrible feast they threw the remains of the dead body into the grave again, and filled it up with the earth which they had dug out. I left them at their work, made haste home, and, leaving the door half open as I had found it, went into my chamber and to bed again, where I pretended to be fast asleep. Soon afterwards Amina returned without the least noise, undressed herself, and came to bed, rejoicing, as I imagined, that she had succeeded so well without being discovered. My mind was so full of the idea of such an abominable action as I had witnessed, that I felt great reluctance to lie by a person who could have had any share in the guilt of it, and was a long time before I could fall asleep. However, I got a short nap, but waked at the first call to public prayers at daybreak, got up, dressed myself, and went to the mosque. 
After prayers, I went out of the town, spent the morning in walking in the gardens, and thinking what I should do to oblige my wife to change her mode of living. I rejected all the violent measures that suggested themselves to my thoughts, and resolved to use gentle means to cure her unhappy and depraved inclination. In this state of reverie, I insensibly reached home by dinner-time. As soon as Amina saw me enter the house, she ordered dinner to be served up, and, as I observed, she continued to eat her rice in the same manner by single grains. I said to her, with all the mildness possible, "'You know, Amina, what reason I had to be surprised when the day after our marriage I saw you eat rice in so small a quantity?' and in a manner which would have offended any other husband but myself. You know also, I contented myself with telling you that I was uneasy at it, and desired you to eat of the other meats, which I had ordered to be dressed several ways, to endeavour to suit your taste. And I am sure my table did not want for variety. But all my remonstrances have had no effect, and you persist in your sullen abstemiousness. I have said nothing, because I would not constrain you, and should be sorry that anything I now say should make you uneasy. But tell me, Amina, I conjure you, are not the meats served up at my table better than the flesh of a human corpse? I had no sooner pronounced these words than Amina, who perceived that I had discovered her last night's horrid voraciousness with the ghoul, flew into a rage beyond imagination. Her face became as red as scarlet, her eyes ready to start out of her head, and she foamed with passion. The terrible state in which she appeared alarmed me so much that I stood motionless, and was not able to defend myself against the horrible wickedness she meditated against me, and which will surprise your majesty. In the violence of her passion, she dipped her hand into a basin of water which stood by her, and, muttering between her teeth some words which I could not hear, she threw some water in my face, and exclaimed in a furious tone, "'Wretch! Receive the punishment of thy prying curiosity, and become a dog!' Amina, whom I did not before know to be a sorceress, had no sooner pronounced these diabolical words then I was immediately transformed into a dog. My amazement and surprise at so sudden and unexpected a metamorphosis prevented my thinking at first of providing for my safety. Availing herself of this suspense, she took up a great stick, with which she laid on me such heavy blows that I wonder they did not kill me. I thought to have escaped her rage by running into the yard, but she pursued me with the same fury, and notwithstanding all my activity, I could not avoid her blows. At last, when she was tired of running after and beating me, and enraged that she had not killed me as she desired, she thought of another method to effect her purpose. She half opened the street door, that she might endeavour to squeeze me to death as I ran out to preserve my life. Dog as I was, I instantly perceived her pernicious design, and as present danger inspires a presence of mind, to elude her vigilance I watched her face and motions so well that I took my opportunity and passed through quick enough to save myself and escape her malice, though she pinched the end of my tail. The pain I felt made me cry out and howl as I ran along the streets, which collected all the dogs about me, and I got bit by several of them. But to avoid their pursuit, I ran into the shop of a man who sold boiled sheep's heads, tongues, and feet, where I saved myself. The man at first took my part with much compassion by driving away the dogs that followed me and would have run into his house. My first care was to creep into a corner to hide myself, but I found not the sanctuary and protection I hoped for, my host was one of those extravagantly superstitious persons who think dogs unclean creatures, and if by chance one happens to touch them in the streets, cannot use soap and water enough to wash their garments clean. After the dogs who chased me were all dispersed and gone, 
he did all he could to drive me out of his house. But I was concealed out of his reach, and spent that night in his shop in spite of him. And indeed, I had need of rest to recover from Amina's ill-treatment. Not to weary your majesty with trifling circumstances, I shall not particularise the melancholy reflections I made on my metamorphosis, but only tell you that my host having gone out the next morning to lay in a stock of sheep's heads, tongues, and trotters, when he returned he opened his shop, and while he was laying out his goods I crept from my corner and got among some other dogs of the neighbourhood who had followed my host by the scent of his meat and surrounded the shop in expectation of having some offal thrown to them. I joined them and put myself among them in a begging posture. My host observing me, and considering that I had eaten nothing while I lay in the shop, distinguished me from the rest by throwing me larger pieces of meat, and oftener than the other dogs. After he had given me as much as he thought fit, I looked at him earnestly and wagged my tail, to show him I begged he would repeat his favours. But he was inflexible, and opposed my entrance with a stick in his hand, and with so stern a look that I felt myself obliged to seek a new habitation. I stopped at the shop of a baker in the neighbourhood, who was of a lively gay temper, quite the reverse of the awful butcher. He was then at breakfast, and though I made no sign that I wanted anything, threw me a piece of bread. Instead of catching it up greedily, as dogs usually do, I looked at him, moving my head and wagging my tail to show my gratitude, at which he was pleased and smiled. Though I was not hungry, I ate the piece of bread to please him, and I ate slowly to show him that it was out of respect to him. He observed this and permitted me to continue near the shop. I sat down and turned myself to the street to show him I then only wanted his protection, which he not only granted, but by his caresses encouraged me to come into the house. This I did in a way that showed it was with his leave. He was pleased, and pointed me out a place where to lie, of which I took possession, and kept while I lived with him. I was always well treated, and whenever he breakfasted, dined, or supped, I had my share of provisions and in return I loved him and was faithful, as gratitude required of me. I always had my eyes upon him, and he scarcely stirred out of doors, or went into the city on business, but I was at his heels. I was the more exact, because I perceived my attention pleased him, for whenever he went out, without giving me time to see him, he would call chance, which was the name he gave me. At this name I used to spring from my place, jump, caper, run before the door, and never cease fawning on him till he went out, and then I always either followed him or ran before him, continually looking at him to show my joy. I had lived some time with this baker when a woman came one day into the shop to buy some bread, who gave my master a piece of bad money among some good, which he returned and requested her to exchange. The woman refused to take it again, and affirmed it to be good. The baker maintained the contrary, and in the dispute told the woman he was sure that the piece of money was so visibly bad that his dog could distinguish it, upon which he called me by name. I immediately jumped on the counter, and the baker, throwing the money down before me, said, "'See, and tell me which of these pieces is bad.' I looked over all the pieces of money, and then set my paw upon that which was bad, separated it from the rest, looking in my master's face to show it him. The baker, who had only called me to banter the woman, was much surprised to see me so immediately pitch upon the bad money. The woman thus convicted had nothing to say for herself, but was obliged to give another piece instead of the bad one. As soon as she was gone, my master called in some neighbours, and enlarged very much on my capacity, telling them what had happened. The neighbours desired to make the experiment, and of all the bad money they showed me, mixed with good, there was not one which I did not set my paw upon, and separate from the rest. The woman also failed not to tell everybody she met what had happened, 
so that the fame of my skill in distinguishing good money from bad was not only spread throughout the neighbourhood but over all that part of the town and insensibly through the whole city i had business enough every day for i was obliged to show my skill to all customers who came to buy bread of my master in short my reputation procured my master more business than he could manage and brought him customers from the most distant parts of the town this run of business lasted so long that he owned to his friends and neighbours that i was a treasure to him my little knowledge made many people envy my master's good fortune and lay snares to steal me away which obliged him always to keep me in his sight one day a woman came like the rest out of curiosity to buy some bread and seeing me sit upon the counter threw down before me six pieces of money among which was one that was bad i separated it presently from the others and setting my paw upon it looked in the woman's face as much as to say is it not so the woman looking at me replied yes you are in the right it is bad and staying some time in the shop to look at and admire me at last paid my master for his bread but when she went out of the shop made a sign unknown to him for me to follow her i was always attentive to any means likely to deliver me out of so strange a metamorphosis and had observed that the woman examined me with an extraordinary attention i imagined that she might know something of my misfortune and the melancholy condition that i was reduced to however i let her go and contented myself with looking at her after walking two or three steps she turned about and seeing that i only looked at her without stirring from my place made me another sign to follow her without deliberating any longer and observing that my master was busy cleaning his oven and did not mind me i jumped off the counter and followed the woman who seemed overjoyed after we had gone some way she stopped at a house opened the door and called to me to come in saying you will not repent following me when i had entered she shut the door and conducted me to her chamber where i saw a beautiful young lady working embroidery this lady who was daughter to the charitable woman who had brought me from the baker's was a very skilful enchantress as i found afterwards daughter said the mother i have brought you the much talked of baker's dog that can tell good money from bad you know i gave you my opinion respecting him when i first heard of him and told you i fancied he was a man changed into a dog by some wicked magician to-day i determined to go to that baker for some bread and was myself a witness of the wonders performed by this dog who has made such a noise in baghdad what say you daughter am i deceived in my conjecture mother you are not answered the daughter and i will disenchant him immediately the young lady arose from her sofa put her hand into a basin of water and throwing some upon me said if thou wert born a dog remain so but if thou wert born a man resume thy former shape by the virtue of this water at that instant the enchantment was broken and i became restored to my natural form penetrated with the greatness of this kindness i threw myself at my deliverer's feet and after i had kissed the hem of her garment said my dear deliverer i am so sensible of your unparalleled humanity towards a stranger as i am that i beg of you to tell me yourself what i can do to show my gratitude or rather dispose of me as a slave to whom you have a just right since i am no more my own but entirely yours and that you may know who i am i will tell you my story in as few words as possible after i had informed her who i was i gave her an account of my marriage with amina of the complaisance i had shown her my patience in bearing with her humour her extraordinary behaviour and the savage inhumanity with which she had treated me out of her inconceivable wickedness and finished my story with my transformation and thanking her mother for the inexpressible happiness she had procured me sayed now maun 
said the daughter to me, let us not talk of the obligation you say you owe me. It is enough for me that I have done any service to so honest a man. But let us talk of Amina, your wife. I was acquainted with her before your marriage, and as I know her to be a sorceress, she also is sensible that I have some of the same kind of knowledge as herself, since we both learnt it of the same mistress. We often meet at the baths, but as our tempers are different, I avoid all opportunities of contracting an intimacy with her, which is no difficult matter, as she does the same by me. I am not at all surprised at her wickedness, but what I have already done for you is not sufficient. I must complete what I have begun. It is not enough to have broken the enchantment by which she has so long excluded you from the society of men. You must punish her, as she deserves, by going home again, and assuming the authority which belongs to you. I will give you the proper means. Converse a little with my mother till I return to you. My deliveress went into a closet, and while she was absent, I repeated my obligations to the mother, as well as the daughter. She said to me, You see, my daughter has as much skill in the magic art as the wicked Amina, but makes such use of it that you would be surprised to know the good she has done, and daily does, by exercising her science. This induces me to let her practice it, for I should not permit her if I perceived she made an improper application of it in the smallest instance. The mother then related some of the wonders she had seen her perform. By this time the daughter returned with a little bottle in her hand. Syed Naumaun, said she, my books which I have been consulting tell me that Amina is now abroad, but will be at home presently. They also inform me that she pretended before your servants to be very uneasy at your absence, and made them believe that at dinner you recollected some business which obliged you to go out immediately, that as you went you left the door open, and a dog running into the hall where she was at dinner, she had beaten him out with a great stick. Take this little bottle, go home immediately, and wait in your own chamber till Amina comes in which she will do shortly. As soon as she returns, run down into the court and meet her face to face. In her surprise at seeing you so unexpectedly, she will turn her back to run away. Have the bottle ready and throw some of the liquor it contains upon her, pronouncing at the same time these words, Receive the chastisement of thy wickedness. I will tell you no more, you will see the effect. After these instructions, I took leave of my benefactress and her mother, with all the testimonies of the most perfect gratitude, and a sincere protestation never to forget my obligation to them, and then went home. All things happened as the beautiful and humane enchantress had foretold. Amina was not long before she came home. As she entered the court, I met her with the bottle in my hand. Upon seeing me, she shrieked and as she turned to run towards the door, I threw the liquor upon her, pronouncing the words which the young lady had taught me, when she was instantly transformed into the mare which your majesty saw me upon yesterday. At that instant, owing to the surprise she was in, I easily seized her by the mane, and notwithstanding her resistance, led her into the stable, where I put a halter upon her head, and when I had tied her to the rack, Reproaching her with her baseness, I chastised her with a whip till I was tired, and have punished her every day since in the manner which your majesty has witnessed. I hope, commander of the faithful, concluded Syed Naumaun, your majesty will not disapprove of my conduct, but will rather think I have shown so wicked and pernicious a woman more indulgence than she deserved." When the caliph found that Syed Naumaun had ended his story, he said to him, Your adventure is very singular, and the wickedness of your wife inexcusable. Therefore, I do not condemn the chastisement you have hitherto given her, but I would have you consider how great a punishment it is to be reduced to the condition of beasts, and wish 
you would be content with the chastisement you have already inflicted. I would order you to go and address yourself to the young enchantress, to end the metamorphosis she has inflicted. But that I know the obstinacy and incorrigible cruelty of magicians of both sexes, who abuse their art, which makes me apprehensive that a second effect of your wife's revenge might be more fatal than the first. The caliph, who was naturally mild and compassionate to all criminals, after he had declared his mind to Syed Nalmaun, addressed himself to the third person the Grand Vizier had summoned to attend him. Khaujah Hassan, said he, passing yesterday by your house, it seemed so magnificent that I felt a curiosity to know to whom it belonged, and was told that you, whose trade is so mean that a man can scarcely get his bread by it, have built this house after you had followed this trade some years. I was likewise informed that you make a good use of the riches God has blessed you with, and your neighbours speak well of you. All this pleases me well, added the caliph, but I am persuaded that the means by which Providence has been pleased to bestow these gifts on you must have been very extraordinary. I am curious to know the particulars from your own mouth, and sent for you on purpose to have that satisfaction. Speak truly, that when I know your story I may rejoice in your good fortune. But that you may not suspect my curiosity, and believe I have any other interest than what I tell you, I declare that, far from having any pretensions, I give you my word you shall enjoy freely all you possess. On these assurances of the caliph, Kalja Hassan prostrated himself before the throne, with his forehead down to the carpet, and when he rose up said, Commander of the Faithful, some persons might have been alarmed at having been summoned to appear before your majesty, but knowing that my conscience was clear, and that I had committed nothing against the laws or your majesty, but on the contrary had always the most respectful sentiments and the profoundest veneration for your person, my only fear was that I should not be able to support the splendour of your presence. But nevertheless, on the public report of your majesty's receiving favourably, and hearing the meanest of your subjects, I took courage, and never doubted but I should have confidence enough to give you all the satisfaction you might require of me. Besides, your majesty has given me a proof of your goodness by granting me your protection before you know whether I deserve it. I hope, however, you will retain the favourable sentiments you have conceived of me, when, in obedience to your command, I shall have related my adventures. After this compliment to conciliate the caliph's good will and attention, and after some moments' recollection, Khalja Hassan related his story in the following manner. End of section 26Section 27 of The Arabian Nights Entertainments, Volume 3 Translated by Jonathan Scott This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry The Adventure of the Caliph Harun al-Rashid Part 4 The Story of Khalja Hassan al-Hubal Commander of the Faithful, that your majesty may the better understand by what means I arrived at the happiness I now enjoy, I must acquaint you, there are two intimate friends, citizens of Baghdad, who can testify the truth of what I shall relate, and to whom, after God, the author of all good, I owe my prosperity. These two friends are called the one Sa'adi, the other Sa'ad. Sa'adi, who is very rich, was always of opinion that no man could be happy in this world without wealth, to live independent of every one. Sa'ad was of a different opinion. He agreed that riches were necessary to comfort, but maintained that the happiness of a man's life consisted in virtue, without any farther eagerness after worldly goods than what was requisite for decent subsistence and benevolent purposes. Sa'ad himself is one of this number, 
and lives very happily and contentedly in his station. But though Saadi is infinitely more opulent, their friendship is very sincere, and the richest sets no more value on himself than the other. They never had any dispute but on this point. In all other things, their union of opinion has been very strict. One day, as they were talking upon this subject, as I have since been informed by them both, Saadi affirmed that poverty proceeded from men's being born poor, or spending their fortunes in luxury and debauchery, or by some of those unforeseen fatalities which do not often occur. "'My opinion,' said he, "'is that most people's poverty is owing to their wanting at first a sufficient sum of money to raise them above want, by employing their industry to improve it. For, continued he, if they once had such a sum, and made a right use of it, they would not only live well, but would in time infallibly grow rich. Saad could not agree in this sentiment. The way, said he, which you propose to make a poor man rich, is not so certain as you imagine. Your plan is very hazardous, and I can bring many good arguments against your opinion. But that they would carry us too far into dispute, I believe, with as much probability, that a poor man may become rich by other means as well as by money. And there are people who have raised as large and surprising fortunes by mere chance, as others have done by money, with all their good economy and management to increase it by the best conducted trade. Sad, replied Saadi, I see we shall not come to any determination by my persisting to oppose my opinion against yours. I will make an experiment to convince you by giving, for example, a sum of money to some artisan, whose ancestors, from father to son, have always been poor, lived only from day to day, and died as indigent as they were born. If I have not the success I expect, you shall try if you will have better by the means you shall employ. Some days after this dispute, the two friends happened to walk out together, and passing through the street where I was at work at my trade of rope-making, which I learnt of my father, who learnt of his, and he of his ancestors, and by my dress and appearance, it was no hard matter for them to guess my poverty. Sa'ad, remembering Sa'adi's engagement, said, If you have not forgotten what you said to me, there is a man, pointing to me, whom I can remember a long time working at his trade of rope-making, and in the same poverty. He is a worthy subject for your liberality, and a proper person to make your experiment upon. I so well remember the conversation, replied Saadi, that I have ever since carried a sufficient sum about me for the purpose, but only waited for an opportunity of our being together that you might be witness of the fact. Let us go to him and know if he is really necessitous. The two friends came to me, and I, seeing that they wished to speak to me, left off work. They both accosted me with the common salutation, and Saadi, wishing me peace, asked me my name. I returned their salutation, and answered Saadi's question, saying to him, Sir, my name is Hassan, but by reason of my trade, I am commonly known by the name of Hassan al-Hubau. Hassan, replied Saadi, as there is no occupation but what a man may live by, I doubt not but yours produces enough for you to live well upon. And I am amazed that during the long time you have worked at your trade, you have not saved enough to lay in a good stock of hemp to extend your manufacture and employ more hands, by the profit of whose work you would soon increase your income. Sir, replied I, you will be no longer amazed that I have not saved money and taken the way you mentioned to become rich when you come to know that let me work as hard as I may from morning till night, I can hardly get enough to keep my family in bread and pulse. I have a wife and five children, not one of whom is old enough to be of the least assistance to me. I must feed and clothe them, 
and in our poor way of living they still want many necessaries which they can ill do without and though hemp is not very dear i must have money to buy it this is the first thing i do with any money i receive for my work otherwise i and my family must starve now judge sir added i if it be possible that i should save anything for myself and family it is enough that we are content with the little god sends us and that we have not the knowledge or desire of more than we want but can live as we have been always bred up and are not reduced to beg when i had given saadi this account he said to me hassan i am not so much surprised as i was for i comprehend what obliges you to be content in your station but if i should make you a present of a purse of two hundred pieces of gold would not you make a good use of it and do not you believe that with such a sum you could become soon as rich as the principal of your occupation sir replied i you seem to be so good a gentleman that i am persuaded you would not banter me but that the offer you make me is serious and i dare say without presuming too much upon myself that a considerably less sum would be sufficient to make me not only as rich as the first of our trade but that in time i should be richer than all of them in this city together though baghdad is so large and populous the generous saadi showed me immediately that in what he said he was serious he pulled a purse out of his bosom and putting it into my hands said here take this purse you will find it contains two hundred pieces of gold i pray god bless you with them and give you grace to make the good use of them i desire and believe me my friend saad whom you see here and i shall both take great pleasure in finding they may contribute towards making you more happy than you now are when i had got the purse the first thing i did was to put it into my bosom but the transport of my joy was so great and i was so much penetrated with gratitude that my speech failed me and i could give my benefactor no other tokens of my feelings than by laying hold of the hem of his garment and kissing it but he drew it from me hastily and he and his friend pursued their walk as soon as they were gone i returned to my work and my first thought was what i should do with my purse to keep it safe i had in my poor house neither box nor cupboard to lock it up in nor any other place where i could be sure it would not be discovered if i concealed it in this perplexity as i had been used like many poor people of my condition to put the little money i had in the folds of my turban i left my work and went into the house under pretence of wrapping my turban up anew i took such precautions that neither my wife nor children saw what i was doing but first i laid aside ten pieces of gold for present necessaries and wrapped the rest up in the folds of the linen which went about my cap the principal expense i was at that day was to lay in a good stock of hemp and afterwards as my family had eaten no flesh meat a long time i went to the shambles and bought something for supper as i was carrying home the meat i had bought a famished vulture flew upon me and would have taken it away if i had not held it very fast but alas i had better have parted with it than lost my money the faster i held my meat the more the bird struggled to get it drawing me sometimes on one side and sometimes on another but would not quit the prize till unfortunately in my efforts my turban fell on the ground the vulture immediately let go his hold but seizing my turban flew away with it i cried out so loud that i alarmed all the men women and children in the neighbourhood who joined their shouts and cries to make the vulture quit his hold for by such means these voracious birds are often frightened so as to quit their prey but our cries did not avail he carried off my turban and we soon lost sight of him and it would have been in vain for me to fatigue myself with running after him 
I went home very melancholy at the loss of my money. I was obliged to buy a new turban, which diminished the small remainder of the ten pieces, for I had laid out several in hemp. The little that was left was not sufficient to give me reason to indulge the great hopes I had conceived. But what troubled me most was the little satisfaction I should be able to give my benefactor for his ineffectual generosity, when he should come to hear what a misfortune I had met with, which he would perhaps regard as incredible, and consequently an idle excuse. While the remainder of the ten pieces lasted, my little family and I lived better than usual, but I soon relapsed into the same poverty, and the same inability to extricate myself from wretchedness. However, I never murmured nor repined. God, said I, was pleased to give me riches when I least expected them. He has thought fit to take them from me again, almost at the same time, because it so pleased him, and they were at his disposal. Yet I will praise his name for all the benefits I have received, as it was his good pleasure, and submit myself, as I have ever done hitherto, to his will. Those were my sentiments, while my wife, from whom I could not keep secret the loss I had sustained, was inconsolable. In my trouble I had told my neighbours that when I lost my turban I lost a hundred and ninety pieces of gold, but as they knew my poverty and could not comprehend how I should have got so great a sum by my work, they only laughed at me. About six months after this misfortune, which I have related to your majesty, the two friends walking through that part of the town where I lived, the neighbourhood brought me to Sa'ad's recollection. "'We are now,' said he to Sa'adi, "'not far from the street where Hassan the rope-maker lives. "'Let us call and see what use he has made "'of the two hundred pieces of gold you gave him, "'and whether they have enabled him to take any steps "'towards bettering his fortune.' "'With all my heart,' replied Sa'adi, I have been thinking of him some days, and it will be a great pleasure and satisfaction to me to have you with me as a witness of the proof of my argument. You will see undoubtedly a great alteration. I expect we shall hardly know him again. Just as Sa'adi said this, the two friends turned the corner of the street, and Sa'ad, who perceived me first at a distance, said to his friend, I believe you reckon without your host. I see Hassan, but can discern no change in his person, for he is as shabbily dressed as when we saw him before. The only difference that I can perceive is that his turban looks something better. Observe him yourself, and see whether I am in the wrong. As they drew nearer to me, Sa'adi saw me too, and found Sa'ad was in the right but could not tell to what he should attribute the little alteration he saw in my person, and was so much amazed that he could not speak when he came up to me. "'Well, Hassan,' said Sa'ad, "'we do not ask you how affairs go since we saw you last. Without doubt they are in a better train.' "'Gentlemen,' replied I, addressing myself to them both, I have the great mortification to tell you that your desires, wishes, and hopes, as well as mine, have not had the success you had reason to expect, and I had promised myself. You will scarcely believe the extraordinary adventure that has befallen me. I assure you, nevertheless, on the word of an honest man, and you ought to believe me, for nothing is more true than what I am going to tell you. I then related to them my adventure with the same circumstances I had the honour to tell your majesty. Sa'adi rejected my assertion, and said, Hassan, you joke, and would deceive me, for what you say is a thing incredible. What have vultures to do with turbans? They only search for something to satisfy their hunger. You have done as all such people as yourself generally do, if they have made any extraordinary gain or any good fortune happens to them, which they never expected. They throw aside their work, take their pleasure, make merry, while the money lasts, and, when they have eaten and drunk it all out, are reduced to the same necessity and want as before. 
you would not be so miserable but because you deserve it and render yourself unworthy of any service done to you sir i replied i bear all these reproaches and am ready to bear as many more if they were more severe and all with the greater patience because i do not think i deserve them the thing is so publicly known in this part of the town that there is nobody but can satisfy you of the truth of my assertions if you inquire you will find that i do not impose upon you i own i never heard of vultures flying away with turbans but this has actually happened to me like many other things which do not fall out every day and yet have actually happened saad took my part and told saadi a great many as surprising stories of vultures some of which he affirmed he knew to be true insomuch that at last he pulled his purse out of his vestband and counted out two hundred pieces of gold into my hand which i put into my bosom for want of a purse when saadi had presented me with this sum he said hassan i make you a present of these two hundred pieces but take care to put them in a safer place that you may not lose them so unfortunately as you have done the others and employ them in such a manner that they may procure you the advantages which the others would have done i told him that the obligation of this his second kindness was much greater than i deserved after what had happened and that i should be sure to make good use of his advice i would have said a great deal more but he did not give me time for he went away and continued his walk with his friend as soon as they were gone i left off work and went home but finding neither my wife nor children within i pulled out my money put ten pieces by and wrapped up the rest in a clean linen cloth tying it fast with a knot but then i was to consider where i should hide this linen cloth that it might be safe after i had considered some time i resolved to put it in the bottom of an earthen vessel full of bran which stood in a corner which i imagined neither my wife nor children would look into my wife came home soon after and as i had but little hemp in the house i told her i should go out to buy some without saying anything to her about the two friends while i was absent a sandman who sells scouring earth for the hair and body which women use in the baths passed through our street and called cleansing ho my wife who wanted some beckoned to him but as she had no money asked him if he would make an exchange of some earth for some bran the sandman asked to see the bran my wife showed him the pot the bargain was made she had the cleansing earth with which she filled a dust hole i had made to the house and the sandman took the pot and bran along with him not long after i came home with as much hemp as i could carry and followed by five porters loaded also with hemp after i had satisfied them for their trouble i sat down to rest myself and looking about me could not see the pot of bran it is impossible for me to express to your majesty my surprise and the effect it had on me at the moment i asked my wife hastily what was become of it when she told me the bargain she had made with the sandman which she thought to be a very good one ah unfortunate woman cried i you know not the injury you have done me yourself and our children by making that bargain which has ruined us for ever you thought you only sold the bran but with the bran you have enriched the sandman with a hundred and ninety pieces of gold which saadi with his friend came and made me a second present of my wife was like one distracted when she knew what a fault she had committed through ignorance she cried beat her breast and tore her hair and clothes unhappy wretch that i am cried she am i fit to live after so dreadful a mistake where shall i find this sandman i know him not i never saw him in our street before oh husband added she you were much to blame to be so reserved in a matter of such importance this had never happened if you had communicated the secret to me 
in short i should never finish my story were i to tell your majesty what her grief made her say you are not ignorant how eloquent women often are in their afflictions wife said i moderate your grief by your weeping and howling you will alarm the neighbourhood and there is no reason they should be informed of our misfortunes they will only laugh at instead of pitying us we had best bear our loss patiently and submit ourselves to the will of god and bless him for that out of two hundred pieces of gold which he had given us he has taken back but a hundred and ninety and left us ten which by the use i shall make of them will be a great relief to us my wife at first did not relish my arguments but as time softens the greatest misfortunes and makes them more supportable she at last grew easy and had almost forgotten them it is true said i to her we live but poorly but what have the rich which we have not do not we breathe the same air enjoy the same light and the same warmth of the sun therefore what conveniences have they more than we that we should envy their happiness they die as well as we in short while we live in the fear of god as we should always do the advantage they have over us is so very inconsiderable that we ought not to covet it i will not tire your majesty any longer with my moral reflections my wife and i comforted ourselves and pursued my trade with as much alacrity as before these two mortifying losses which followed one another so quickly the only thing that troubled me sometimes was how i should look saadi in the face when he should come and ask me how i had improved his two hundred pieces of gold and advanced my fortune by means of his liberality i saw no remedy but to resolve to submit to the confusion i should feel though it was by no fault of mine this time any more than before that our misfortune had happened the two friends stayed away longer this time than the former though saad had often spoken to saadi who always put it off for said he the longer we stay away the richer hassan will be and i shall have the greater satisfaction saad who had not the same opinion of the effect of his friend's generosity replied you fancy then that your last present will have been turned to a better account than the former i would advise you not to flatter yourself too much for fear you may be more sensibly mortified if it should prove otherwise why replied saadi vultures do not fly away with turbans every day and hassan will have been more cautious this time i do not doubt it replied saad but added he there are other accidents that neither you nor i can think of therefore i say again moderate your expectations and do not depend too much on hassan's success for to tell you what i think and what i always thought whether you like to hear it or not i have a secret presentiment that you will not have accomplished your purpose and that i shall succeed better in proving that a poor man may sooner become rich by other means than money one day when saad and saadi were disputing upon this subject saad observed that enough had been said i am resolved continued he to inform myself this very day what has passed it is a pleasing time for walking let us not lose it but go and see which of us has lost the wager i saw them at a distance was overcome with confusion and was just going to leave my work to run and hide myself however i refrained appeared very earnest at work made as if i had not seen them and never lifted up my eyes till they were close to me and had saluted me and then i could not help myself i hung down my head told them my last misfortune with all the circumstances and that i was as poor as when they first saw me after that i added you may say that i ought to have hidden my money in another place than in a pot of bran which was carried out of my house the same day but that pot had stood there many years and had never been removed whenever my wife parted with the bran 
could i guess that a sandman should come by that very day my wife have no money and would make such an exchange you may indeed allege that i ought to have told my wife of it but i will never believe that such prudent persons as i am persuaded you are would have given me that advice and if i had put my money anywhere else what certainty could i have had that it would be more secure i see sir said i addressing myself to saadi that it has pleased god whose ways are secret and impenetrable that i should not be enriched by your liberality but that i must remain poor however the obligation is the same as if it had wrought the desired effect after these words i was silent and saadi replied though i would persuade myself hassan that all you tell us is true and not owing to your debauchery or ill-management yet i must not be extravagant and ruin myself for the sake of an experiment i do not regret in the least the four hundred pieces of gold i gave you to raise you in the world i did it in duty to god without expecting any recompense but the pleasure of doing good if anything makes me repent it is that i did not address myself to another who might have made a better use of my charity then turning about to his friend saad continued he you may know by what i have said that i do not entirely give up the cause you may now make your experiment and let me see that there are ways besides giving money to make a poor man's fortune let hassan be the man i dare say whatever you may give him he will not be richer than he was with four hundred pieces of gold saad had a piece of lead in his hand which he showed saadi you saw me said he take up this piece of lead which i found on the ground i will give it hassan and you shall see what it is worth saadi burst out laughing at saad what is that bit of lead worth said he a farthing what can hassan do with that saad presented it to me and said take it hassan let saadi laugh you will tell us some news of the good luck it has brought you one time or another i thought saad was in jest and had a mind to divert himself however i took the lead and thanked him the two friends pursued their walk and i fell to work again at night when i pulled off my clothes to go to bed the piece of lead which i had never thought of from the time he gave it to me tumbled out of my pocket i took it up and laid it on the place that was nearest me End of section twenty seven